and good morning to those who are online as well. Um, so if anyone can lead us, we will begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day, Lord. You brought us here. Um, you equipped us here, Lord, my Father. Give us all the knowledge and wisdom so that we can able to understand your words, Lord, and uh, fulfill uh, us with your spirit, Lord, for us your spirit so that we could able to understand. And also I'm praying for the pastor as well. Um, give her uh, all the blessings, all uh, the knowledge and wisdom so that she could able to uh, teach us, Lord, my Father. Lord, whatever I left in the prayer, you know everything, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, last week we did, okay, on Monday. On Monday we did Leviticus. Uh, so if you have any questions, as usual, and I'm just saying, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand uh, or you can type in the chat. Uh, so even during the class, while we are doing numbers today, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or you know write uh, down your question in the chat. Uh, so I will not uh, stress upon it in future, but it's understood. Uh, it's good if you can clear your doubt at that time itself rather than keeping it for later, because later uh, you know I may forget what I have exactly said, or you also may lose your train of thought. Uh, so if you have any questions at any point of time regarding last session or even the current session, uh, just feel free to lift up your hand or to uh, write down in the chat uh, your questions. So we will now get into the book of numbers today. Um, why uh, did the Latin Bible use the term numbers? You know, because we generally don't go with the headings, uh, with, the, with the book names which the Hebrew Bible had. We tend to go with the um, book headings which the Latin Bible originally had. So they are the ones who chose Genesis. They are the ones who chose Exodus. So in the same way, Numbers also was chosen for the uh, Latin Bible. So the word Numbers is used because there are two numberings done in the book of Numbers. The population of, the, of Israel was numbered twice. Uh, you know, the population census was taken two times. The first, of course, was when the people were getting ready to enter into the promised land. And they were very eager uh, because God had freed them, brought them out of Egypt. And now finally, they were going to get into the land. And they were very um, um, happy with what God had done. And at that time, there is a census taken, a population census is taken to find out how many uh, males are there. How many people of military age are there, 20 years and above, who can fight uh, with the locals and be able to claim the victory which God is, you know, uh, has destined for them as a people? But then, when the spies go to do their survey, uh, the people panic uh, when the spies give a negative report. So they are afraid, and then uh, they say, "No, no, we do not want to enter the land." And then uh, the Lord is angry with them for their lack of trust and faith in him. And so then they are um, made to wander for 40 years in the wilderness until this entire generation, which has no trust or faith in the Lord, can you know uh, go to their graves. And then a new generation, which will hopefully have greater faith in the Lord, will be able to grow up and take their place. So the first numbering is done when they are initially planning on entering the promised land uh, because uh, the numbers are needed to find out exactly how many fighting men they will have to conquer all the places which God has uh, you know, uh, planned for them. So that is the reason why mainly uh, the census was taken in those days, in Old Testament times. It was to find out how many soldiers they can have on their side uh, because Nowadays, we don't rely, uh, rely that much on soldier, on the number of soldiers. We rely more on technology. 
uh, you know, uh, the kind of drones we have and the kind of uh, bombs that we have and the kind of biological warfare that we have. We So we depend more on technology. Back then, it was numbers. The larger the number of, uh, uh, you know, the, the army of soldiers you have, the greater chances that you will win. Uh, because if the other army has got a smaller number of soldiers, it will be easier to finish them off. So um, the first numbering was done with that purpose. And then uh, because they refused to place their faith in the Lord, they were you know, uh, condemned to wandering in the wilderness for 40 long years. And then at the end of 40 years, uh, when all of the old generation have died, and now you have a new generation which has um, grown up you know, and is now old enough to enter into the land. So at that time, there is a second numbering done. Because now, again, they need to assess and find out how many fighting men are available. So there are two numberings which take place. And the remarkable thing that we see in the book of Numbers is that we are told that in that 40 years when they were wandering around in the wilderness, where you don't have supermarkets, where you don't have shops where you can go and purchase new clothes, new shoes. The Lord preserves what they have. Their shoes don't wear out. Their clothes you know, stay um, uh, in, a, in, a, in remarkable condition. The Lord takes care of them. I mean, they do not even have crops out there. They're literally moving from one place to another. They're not staying in one particular place where they can you know, start growing crops to feed themselves. So which means even food has to be provided on a daily basis by the Lord for this large number. And we are told in the scriptures that God takes care of every detail. He is angry with them for their lack of faith. Um, and so he does punish them by saying that they will not enter the promised land. But in spite of his uh, you know, judgment against them, he takes care of them in every way, remarkably. So that actually um, should give us a glimpse into the character of our God. Yes, he stands for righteousness and justice. He expects us to follow his standards. And when we do not follow those standards, yes, he is displeased with us. But at the same time, he is a compassionate God. He never forgets that compassion of his. It's always there, you know, he always cares for us. So that is something that we see over here. Um, it is in uh, Numbers 14.34 that we are told that the everything that the people require is provided for 40 years. And there's another one thing that we see in this book of Numbers. In many places in Numbers, again and again, one particular instruction is repeated. And that instruction is um, to teach your children the ways of God. Again and again, the people are instructed to teach their children the ways of Yahweh and the law which has been given. Why this constant reminder again and again? That is because um, the older generation failed to you know, show their uh, trust in Yahweh. But now, if they can train up their children to know the law, to know Yahweh, to be able to uh, know the history of their ancestors and what uh, God had done for them, you know, for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. If they are taught these things from a young age, uh, the hope is that by the time they become ready to enter the promised land, their faith would have been built up. So today we may not be entering into Canaan, but then our children also need to be prepared for the future. So this instruction, which is repeated again and again in the book of Numbers, very much applies to us today. Are we training up our children in the ways of the Lord, in the scriptures? Or do we consider it a responsibility of just the children's church or the Sunday school? That is not enough. Yes, Sunday school and children's church is a place where the children gather together to worship together in a group setting. But that one-on-one -on -one training and that impartation, that has to be done at home on a daily basis. So um, uh, in Numbers, uh, some of the references which you know um, give this instruction, they would be Numbers 4.9, Numbers 6.7, um, also Numbers 6.20 to 25, 
numbers 11, 19, uh, numbers 32, 46. These are some of the references where we are told um, that the children should be trained up in the ways of Yahweh. Um, coming to the structure, the overall structure of the book of Numbers, uh, let's look at that very briefly. Um, maybe we can divide uh, Numbers into four main divisions. The first section would be chapters 1 to 9, um, because uh, that is where the, you know, the census is taken, the first census is taken uh, to find out how many are uh, available for the military service. And also um, Moses dedicates the Levites because now they're going to be entering into the land and they would be serving the Lord in that place. So they also are dedicated. Um, all this takes place in the first nine chapters. And then in chapters 10 to 12 um, is where we see the people grumbling against the Lord. Um, they are tired of the manna which the Lord is providing and they want uh, meat. Uh, so there is that act of rebellion. We also see another act of rebellion, not from the people, but from the leaders, from Miriam and Aaron. That is also recorded in chapters 10 to 12. So 10 to 12 has got a, a few accounts of rebellion uh, and strife. Then the next third section would be chapters 13 to 19. This is the section where uh, you have the spies actually going to survey the land. And they come back with their report. Ten of them are very negative in what they say. And you have two of them speaking very positively with faith uh, about how they can take the land. Uh, so that would be chapters 13 to 19. And finally, you have the last section, uh, which would be chapters 20 to 36, where um, the second census is now taken. And we also see Joshua being appointed, anointed as the new leader. Uh, so Joshua is appointed as the new leader and Moses is very clearly banned from entering into the promised land. Uh, so these are the four se main sections. Now uh, let's look at some of the main concepts, highlights in this book of Numbers. The first one, um, maybe uh, can be Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. And that is basically where we see this strife which takes place between uh, Miriam Aaron and Moses. Uh, the, so the details are given in Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 9, where Miriam and Aaron basically say, hasn't the Lord spoken through us also? Why does Moses think that he's the only one you know, who can hear from the Lord? And uh, that's basically how the issue begins. So if we were to go to Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 9, uh, maybe we, just for us to get an idea of what is going on here, maybe we could just read out the first three verses. Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, if someone could quickly read out, please. Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Miriam and Aaron begin to talk against Moses because of his Kushut wife, for he had married a Kushut. As the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked, Has not he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. All right, so uh, we get to know here that Moses has married for a second time. And uh, Moses was someone who honored the Lord, walked in his ways. Uh, you know, those of you at the back, either you do not, uh, you're not able to follow the lesson or uh, you simply are not interested. Please, if you could pay attention. Okay, I, uh, I noticed this in almost every class, uh, those, uh, you know, the if you were the back, if you are unable to follow the class, then you know maybe you could go upstairs. But please do not distract the others. Yeah. So uh, in Numbers chapter twelve, uh, verses one to three, we get to know that Moses has married for a second time, and he is the person who has written Genesis chapter two, where it says that a man should, uh, you know, cleave to his wife 
so which means he would not have just um, you know um, in a very reckless manner married for a second time so we can be quite sure that his first wife probably has passed away and that is the reason why he is now choosing to marry a second time he would not have been the kind of person who would just take two wives three wives you know like the others because he respected and honored the word of the lord uh, so he chooses to marry this kushite person um who probably would have been uh, from you know the egyptian uh, region and she would have been more dark skinned okay so uh, the uh, these people probably would have been of fairer skin but the this lady that moses has married is from another race from another culture her skin would have been more dark and uh, miriam and aaron are not happy with this decision that has been taken and so they say hasn't uh, the lords also spoken through us indirectly they are saying um, you know we don't think that this was god's will moses has taken his own decision he has taken the wrong decision is he the only one who can hear from god don't we also hear from god i'm sure we are right when we are saying that he should not have married this person and it says over there that that last line of uh, verse 2 it says and the lord heard this a big and a very important point to keep in mind when we are especially talking about god's people about god's children and maybe even uh, god's leaders the lord hears what we are saying so before we are very hasty in passing judgment on anyone um, whether it be a leader or whether it's just a, you know a member of our church the lord hears what we are saying and you know we know this about parents and children right if you were to say something about a child about someone else's child and the parent hears that you better be warned because you know that mother is going to swoop down upon you like one uh, bear you know it, the lord is like that he's very possessive about his children so when you are um, passing judgments upon people be very careful with your words because the lord hears what is being said and in the next sentence it says now moses was a very humble man more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth so he did not retaliate when his older brother and sister began to condemn him and criticize him he probably tried to explain that what he has done he has done in a godly manner you know with god's will in mind maybe he tried to reason with them but he did not retaliate he did not try to aggressively push his case forward in a way he left it in the lord's hands and so the lord decides to act on his behalf and so the lord says in verse 4 you know he says come out to the tent of meeting all three of you come there and i will let you know what i think about you know what you have done and so when the three of them aaron um, miriam and their younger brother moses when they go and stand over there in front of the tabernacle the lord comes over there and the lord you know expresses his uh, displeasure regarding this he says in verse um 6 he says you know generally when i talk to people i either speak to them in visions or i speak to them in dreams but i don't bother with visions and dreams when it comes to moses i just talk to him directly face to face that is the kind of relationship that this man has with me who are you people to question whether he has done the will of god or not i talk to this man directly so he knows what my heart is what my will is and he has been walking in my ways who are you to point fingers at him without knowing the entire story you know is is indirectly what the lord seems to be saying over here so that is why he says in verse 7 in, in fact this is the lord it's not humans who are giving this compliment god himself is saying uh but uh he says uh yeah this is not true of my servant moses uh you know with because i talk to him directly and he says he is faithful in all my house here is one man in all of my household of israel here is one man whom i am finding most faithful so just because you see someone having taken a decision which you may not approve of 
don't jump to conclusions and think that they are not being faithful to their lord and master we know so little about what goes on in a, in a, you know in someone else's home what goes on in another person's life we don't know their situations their circumstances here the lord who has been uh, looking at moses and interacting with him says he is faithful in all my house and that is why he says you know i i speak with him face to face and not in riddles and then the lord says why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant moses here the principle being given you know the spiritual principle which is being uh, laid out in front of all of us is we should actually be afraid scared to speak against the people of god because the lord knows the truth we may not know the entire details so he says you should the lord says you should be scared to talk recklessly about other believers and uh, then it goes on to say that the anger of the lord burned against them and he left them and then after that we you know we read in the following verses uh, that miriam develops a skin disease um, as a result of that uh, and then um, um the lord has mercy on her and you know um he restores her back to health but not immediately she has to stay in that condition for a number of days maybe you know giving her time to think about what she has done and what she has said and to repent uh, so um what we learn from this is that we should be careful in the way we judge people uh, uh just to look at one new testament verse Uh, which talks about that maybe Matthew chapter seven. If someone could turn, you know, in their Bibles to Matthew chapter seven, verses one and two, um, that is uh, is the most useful and helpful verse for us. Matthew seven one to two. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the ju judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you see you use, it will be measured back to you. these are the words of jesus he says in the same way you judge others you will be judged so if you are a person who shows no mercy then you will also be shown very less mercy these are very serious words you know so when we are assessing other people if we can be generous and compassionate uh you know in our assessments of people the lord also will be very generous in the way he assesses us uh, so this is something to keep in mind um okay uh, moving on to another lesson that we can learn from the book of numbers this uh, is from the story of pora now that would be numbers chapter 16 now this is another rebellion which takes place in the book of numbers uh, chapter 16 uh you have kora who is a levite and you have a couple of rubenites uh, two persons from the uh, from the tribe of ruben datan and abiram these three persons are not happy with the responsibility and position which they hold they want something higher they want to become priests so um kora who is a levite and this datan and abiram who are rubenites they uh, start to um stir up the people they go and start talking to people and probably they are saying things like you know this moses his leadership is not really good i wish he would do things a little differently look at that aaron aaron he just listens to what his brother says doesn't stand up for himself i mean we don't know we don't know in what way they stirred up the people but they began to stir up the people because they want to make themselves more powerful and they want to get the backing of the people so as a result of um, this um, this strife which they are trying to stir up among the people uh, it says in verse 2 numbers chapter 16 verse 2 they rose up against moses with them were 250 israelite men well known community leaders so these three men are so um maybe so diplomatic in the way they do it that they are able to get the support of 250 leaders who are willing to rebel against Aaron and Moses and take sides with them and uh, so their uh, basic uh, belief is that these three men should also be made into priests 
um, and they completely forget the point that ministry is not a human venture. Ministry is God's property. So the one who is the head of the ministry gets to decide what he wants to give to whom. Ministry is not something which we, you know, take up for ourselves, like, you know, the way we take up a business venture. Ministry is entirely his property. He decides whom he wants to appoint, where, who should be doing which kind of a task. Entirely the Lord's decision. These people are approaching this whole uh, ministry as though it is some kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, human societal role. No. So they are forgetting all of that. And so they, they, they stir up a lot of people against Moses. And then um, this is what the Lord does. He says uh, that they are to gather in front of the tabernacle, all the 250 of them, including these three uh, people who have done the stirring up of the strife. All of them are, are supposed to come and stand in front of, the, front of the tabernacle to offer incense to the Lord. This is something which the priests do. Okay, this is a privilege which the priests have. They alone are allowed to offer incense before the Lord. So the Lord says, all of you come over here. You know, you want to be priests, right? So you come over here to offer your incense. And I will tell you what I think about your offering the incense. So they all go and stand over there. And then uh, um, this is what we are told. Uh, Numbers chapter 16, verses 31 to maybe 33. Three, if someone could read out Numbers 16, 31 to 33. Now it come to pass and he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth, it mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all men Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. So basically we see over here that the incense being offered by these other people who are not, uh, you know, Aaron and Moses, the Lord does not approve of it. And in fact, the ground opens up and they are swallowed into the ground along with their entire households and along with all of their possessions. So God's judgment against them and their households is complete. Why even the household? Why even the family members? Because the family members did not stand up to them and correct them and tell them that what they are doing is wrong. Either through their silence or through their consent, they supported these people in going ahead with the rebellion. It would have taken months for this to happen. It didn't happen in one day. And during that entire process, the family was just watching. They did not correct. They did not try to stop it in any way. So they, they and their households are judged by the Lord and they all perish. And then this Israelite community, instead of having learned from this lesson, you know, after instead of being afraid of the wrath of the Lord, they start grumbling the next day. And they say to Moses and Aaron, we see this in verse 41, they say, you have killed the Lord's people. Did they go around with a sword and kill the Lord's people? The Lord himself opened up the ground. And now they are saying, you have killed the Lord's people. So what was Moses' response when these people accuse him now after something so, after something so cataclysmic has happened? And now they're making this accusation. What is Moses' response? Does he say, yesterday you saw what happened, right? You know what God did, right? Today, God is going to do the same thing to you. Ha, ha, ha. Does he say that? No. His immediate response is he turns to Aaron and he says, God's anger is going to come down. Quickly go and you know bring incense to burn it before the Lord as a peace offering so that he will spare these people so that they will not die. Moses is not happy to see the destruction of the others rather than, you know, um, allowing God to destroy the people who are accusing him. He immediately takes action to protect them. He says to Aaron, quickly, quickly go fill up your censer with burning coals, offer it to the Lord 
so as a peace offering maybe the lord will forgive the people and spare them and aaron immediately goes running aaron doesn't say ah oh, let them die no aaron immediately does that he goes running he takes the censer and even as they are doing this the plague of the lord has already started and people have started to die all throughout the camp um so we see that 14700 people die and in the meantime aaron is able to get the incense is a you know he 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 places himself in between the living and the dead that's what it says in verse 48 it says aaron stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped it's as if you know he's offering up the incense and saying lord no further please do not go any further so many have died but please don't touch the ones who are still left and the lord stops so here we see two things we see one group of people who have no respect for the ministry of god they think it's something which they can just take up as they wish uh, and on the other hand you have a couple of men aaron and moses who are so committed to this ministry of the lord and to his people god's people that they are willing to protect those people of god even though those people of god have been accusing them so we see two very different attitudes over here the self centered self ambitious people acting in one way and on the other side moses and aaron who have the same heart which god has so rather than wanting the destruction of those who are pointing fingers at them they rush to protect them to defend them to keep them from the anger of god so um this is a um an a, a story that brings out the heart that we can choose to have so we can be like those ambitious people who you know who are first talked about in one category or we can choose to be like the other uh, uh, two moses and aaron who chose to have a godly heart yes we do have a question go ahead um how can we justify this killings man like uh, mm. uh was there uh, like god is all knowing like uh, didn't he have another plan uh, to show whom he has chosen and whom he has not chosen why why kill like killing the enemy nations we can understand uh, they were against israel and uh, we can understand that but uh, killing his own people like he has got them out uh, out of the slavery and he has let them till now and how can we justify that yeah so um so whatever you asked is audible for these people online right okay they can okay so they, you already know the question all right so um uh, the first uh, part of the question is um how did they know who is chosen and who is not chosen that the lord made very plain in the beginning itself when he said aaron is going to be appointed as the high priest his descendants are going to be priests and the levites they will have their own duties but the levites are not priests so all that is made very very clear uh, at mount sinai itself so by now the people are very very clear who has been uh, appointed for which position and the anointing for only that particular position has been given to the assigned person so they all know what their uh, specific responsibilities are going to be and now coming to their defiance where they defied what god had designated so now they're openly saying what you appointed and assigned we don't really are like we would like to have our own designations and our own positions so now they are basically defying the lord and now the lord uh, you know um, acts in um, judgment against them so how would we justify that the way the lord justifies it is that he says i am holy i am completely other from all creation and i am the one who made this creation so basically as its sovereign master he gets to decide you know whether um, um the what role his creation is going to take uh, what what uh, responsibilities they're going to fulfill so when anyone or anything defies what he has ordained as the creator he has the right to show himself holy to declare himself uh, holy by taking action against them 
in the book of leviticus the main the one main theme that ran throughout that entire book was that he he says about himself the lord i am holy and i am going to display myself as this holy god and the entire all the nations which are watching are going to see that i am completely sovereign and i am the decider i get to decide what i want to do so even in this particular occasion he is displaying his complete otherness and his complete sovereignty and saying i can choose what i wish to do and i declare that i am completely righteous when he's when he's explaining his name to moses he says i am compassionate he talks about how he is long suffering so he describes all the uh, uh, the more uh, what what we would call the more mellow attributes of his but he also talks about the judgment part he says if anyone chooses to defy me then i will bring judgment upon them so he has made it very clear about who he is about the various traits of his holiness he has completely clearly described so therefore in line with the traits of who he is he also brings that judgment so compassion is part of who he is but righteous judgment is also part of who he is so um that is why uh even though the lord loves everyone on the planet today there are some criteria that he has laid down so those who do not meet that criteria will go to hell even though he loves everyone uh, because he has said i have made a way through jesus christ so if anyone chooses not to accept jesus christ even though he loves them they will go to hell because they have chosen to ignore the provision that he made so here uh for kora and the rubenites the way out would have been to repent if they had repented when when moses approached them then the lord would have forgiven them but they chose not to repent they boldly aggressively went with their censers and stood in front of the tabernacle the next day knowing what god's god stand has been they could have repented they had a choice to repent but they chose not to repent so i guess what we can say is that the justification is that they were given a chance to repent but they chose not to so god showed himself glory himself glorious and holy by displaying who he is uh, i hope that is helpful to an extent okay so um we have looked at how other people acted against god maybe we can also look at one example of moses himself who dishonored god this was the man with whom god spoke directly face to face because he was a most faithful in the household of god so this was a man who knew god's heart intimately this is a man who more than other people knew exactly what god wants so knowing all of that he does something which displeases god uh so that would be exodus chapter 17 is where you have that that particular story um maybe we can read out just two verses exodus 17 uh verses 1 and verse 6 exodus 17 1 and 6 and the lord spoke to moses saying uh not really unless i got my reference oh, wrong uh exodus 17 verse 1 and also verse 6 the whole israelite community set out from the desert of sin traveling from place to place as the lord commanded they camped at ragim dim but they were there was no water for the people to drink okay I, then ah uh, verse 6 yeah i will stand there before you by the rock at erob strike the rock and water will come out of it from for the people to drink so moses did this in the sight of the elders of israel okay now that is the first uh, instance when moses brings water out of a rock now we will look at the second instance where you have a god is displeased that will be numbers chapter 20 uh, verses 7 and 8 yeah numbers 20 verses 7 and 8 the second instance where moses is, is asked to bring water out of the rock the lord said to moses take the stuff and you and your brother aaron gather the assembly together 
speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water you will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink so here we have two instances two events where the people are uh, desperate for water and now uh, water has to be brought out of the rock in the first instance in the first event exodus 17 the lord clearly commands moses to strike the rock and he is told strike the rock and water will come out of it but here in the second event numbers 20 uh, verses 7 and 8 the lord says speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water so there are two separate instructions given however when we look at the numbers 20 account we see that moses he does not obey rather um, it says in verse 11 maybe we can read out verses 11 and 12 numbers 20 verses 11 and 12 please then moses raised his arm and stuck the rock twice with his stuff water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. So in the second event, instead of speaking to the rock, Moses strikes the rock. And this is what the Lord says. The Lord says, you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites. God has one thing on his mind. He is holy and he wishes to be displayed as holy and he expects his followers to, to, to demonstrate to everyone that he is holy. When we fail to do that, that displeases the Lord greatly. So the Lord is upset that Moses and Aaron did not honor him in front of all the people because they knew the instructions which had been given. God had said that he is supposed to go and speak. But this man chooses not to speak. He chooses to strike. And so now if all the people are watching and seeing that Moses has directly disobeyed what God has said. And God says, you have dishonored me in front of all of them. So from Leviticus, this theme begins to run where God says, I am utterly holy. Be careful how you're conducting yourself in, you know, in my presence. Are you honoring me? When people look at the way you treat me, do they realize how great I am and how utterly different I am? Or are you treating me and behaving in my presence in such a way that they get the, the other people who are watching get the impression that, oh, I'm no big deal. So over here, Moses and Aaron fail to honor the Lord in front of the people. Even today, this applies to us, you know, in our workplaces. If we are, uh, work, uh, if we are functioning at a higher standard, if we do not lie, if we do not cheat, if we do not compromise, people will come to us and ask, why are you acting extra holy? What's the problem? You think you're great? You think you're superior? And so then our answer would be, we fear the Lord our God because he is utterly holy. So we need to honor him by living at this, at, at, you know, at these standards. We cannot compromise because that would dishonor him. When we explain why we are doing it, they begin to realize, oh, the God of these people must be extremely holy for them to walk in such reverence and fear. So it, so by doing that, we are displaying his holiness to everyone and we, everyone is getting to see how really big and honorable he is. So here in this particular instance, Moses and Aaron failed to do that. A man who has spoken with God face to face fails to honor this God whom he knows so personally. And that is why the Lord is highly displeased. And the Lord says to him, you will not enter the promised land because that would mean that you know i'm quite okay with people dishonoring me it would create it would, it would convey a completely wrong message so the lord says 
even though it is a painful thing i will not allow you to enter the promised land so um as we are doing this first five books of the old testament it should begin to create an awareness in us that this god whom we worship is holy and he expects us to display his holiness honor his holiness respect him and revere him and then having you know made this picture of our yahweh very very clear in this first five books then the uh, the other books of the um, old testament follow so these five books are setting the standard showing us exactly who is this living god what his expectations are what his standards are and what his response is when we fail to do what he tells us to do so uh, these five first five books are rather important in that sense because they are laying out uh, you know the pattern the the standard for the rest of what is to follow so this is regarding how the moses and aaron failed to uphold the holiness of god yeah in fact that's the wording which uh, god uses in deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 50 to 52 where you know moses is about to die and the lord says you can go up on the mountain and look at the promised land but you will not be able to enter and again he says the same thing over here in this particular place in deuteronomy 32 uh, verse 51 he says you did not uphold my holiness among the israelites so the lord is very very particular and serious about this you know we all pray and we say lord we want to please you we want to make you happy we want to honor you how do you do that a simple way is to do this in everything that you think in everything that you speak in every in every interaction of yours with people do it in such a way that it shows how much you fear and revere him and then people will automatically think my goodness that god must be really big for them to show him that much respect you know it automatically shows so we need to uphold his holiness in all that we do we need to display who he is by the way we are conducting our selves and of course there is another reason also why god was angry with moses and we see that in first corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 if someone could very quickly read out that first corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 please and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that uh, spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was christ it says over here that in the old testament times there was an invisible rock who was walking along with the people through their 40 years in the wilderness as they were wandering there was a spiritual rock who was going along with them and that rock was jesus christ so these physical rocks were in a way representing jesus the first time in the in the book of exodus where the rock had to be struck for the living waters to come out that symbolized jesus being struck on the cross so that the living waters which he is releasing for us can come to us so yes he had to be struck once but then in hebrews chapter 7 verse 27 it says he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day in hebrews 7:27 it says he sacrificed for their sins once for all so the rock the spiritual rock jesus christ needed to be struck only once the second time you only go to the rock and you request and you say please give me the waters because the striking has already been done finished so jesus christ doesn't have to go and hang on the cross once again to answer your prayers and mine jesus christ the rock has already been struck now all we need to do is go to him and speak to him and ask him for what we need okay so this is the uh, other deeper meaning that comes out of this uh, passage so yeah we could only cover a few things from the book of numbers uh, let's just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for the spiritual truths that are contained uh, in each book of the old testament lord lord we pray that we would be people uh, who don't just hear these things 
but we would be doers of these things, that we would um, practice the lessons that we are picking up from these Old Testament characters so that, Lord, in our current day, we will uphold your holiness and show the whole world how holy and reverent, reverential you are and how uh, high and supreme you are over all other gods. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to conduct ourselves in that way and bring much honor and glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.